scholarship offering. Tonight, I'm excited about preaching our second part in the series of the Spirit of Man. And I think tonight will be a help to you. And that's really all that I want. I, I just want to be a help to you uh, when it comes to uh, your spirit, your Christian walk. And these messages are all meant to be just extremely practical. And uh, that's what I'm aiming at. All right, open your Bibles, please, to Luke chapter number 9. Luke chapter number 9, please. And we're going to start reading in verse number 51. Luke chapter number 9. Y'all glad to be here this evening? Say a pray for me. My, my brain is on overload right now. I've got so much going on in my brain right now as far as just my, you know, just thinking about things and going a hundred different directions all at once. And then my body's starting to get worn out a little bit tonight. <laughs> so we'll probably be done in about eight minutes and I'll be done preaching. So y'all listen, y'all listen quickly and I'll preach quickly. All right. Luke, <laughs> Luke chapter number, number uh, nine. Are you there? Say amen. Oh, me. All right. Luke, you had not even opened your Bible yet. All right. Luke chapter number nine. And uh, look down at verse number 51. We're going to read six verses, starting in verse number 51. All right. Are you paying attention? All right. Luke chapter number nine. If you're looking at the Bible, that's fine. But don't be talking to each other if you can help it. And uh, just sit up, sit straight and listen. Verse 51. And it came to pass when the time was come that he should be received up. He steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers before his face, and they went and entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. And they did not receive him, because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, even as Elias did? But he turned and rebuked them and said, You know not what manner of spirit ye are of. For the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. Verse 55 is my key thought this, morning, this evening, what I'll be focusing on. It says, But he turned and rebuked them and said, You know not what manner of spirit ye are of. I'm, uh, the title of my message is a question. What manner of spirit are you? That's the title of my message this evening. What manner of spirit are you? Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for allowing us to be here this evening. I love you, Lord. I'm so grateful for the privilege and opportunity to preach. And I just pray, Holy Spirit of God, that you'll give me your power. Help me to say exactly what you once said. I pray for your mind. Give me the mind of Christ. And then I pray for every person here to have ears to hear, a heart to receive, and a mind to comprehend. Bless those that are watching online. Please meet their needs. Lord, please just do what only you can do, and we'll give you all the glory, and we'll thank you for what you'll do in Jesus' name. Amen. This, the background of the story is simply this. This is an opinion of mine. I, I think I can extrapolate um, the situation here. And, uh, and so that everybody's sitting up straight now, paying attention, please. And uh, thank you. And so we, um, um, we're, we're talking about, uh, I think I can extrapolate it from the, uh, from the, from the passage, but Jesus, it was nearing the time that he was going to be crucified. And so he had set his face to go to Jerusalem. He had gone around in different villages and different cities and was preaching. And, um, and so now it's time to get back to Jerusalem because it's getting close to the time that he's going to be offering up himself as a sacrifice. And so what he did was on his way, he had sent messengers into a, in, into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. Now, you know what the Samaritans were. I, I've taught you this in the past. Samaritans were half Jews and half Gentiles. So they were not full-blooded Jews. They were not full-blooded Gentiles. They were offspring of someone who was Jewish, who married or had a relationship with someone who was a Gentile. And so the Jews were extremely proud people. And, um, and, and, you know, and, and one of the issues of them not receiving Christ was their pride. But they, they, they looked down upon anybody that was half Jew. I mean, if you were not full Jew, you were, you, were, you were dirt in their eyes often. And Samaritans were not looked upon very well uh, from the Jewish community. But on the way to Jerusalem, um, he was approaching a village of the Samaritans. And he said to his disciples, would you go before me before our group gets there and make sure there's a place for us to stay? 
and make sure that we can be accommodated before we, you know, for the night uh, before we make it to Jerusalem. And well, the Samaritans, of course, now they're offended, not because they're thinking they're better than the Jews, but they're offended because what? We're not important enough for you to come to us? As far as, you know, you're coming here to see us? No, you're going to Jerusalem, and we're just sort of a, oh, by the way, let's just stay here. So we don't want you here. So they got offended at Jesus because, you know, he said, I'm going to Jerusalem, but I need a place to stay tonight. And they were like, what, you don't care about us? We're not worthy of your time? All right, forget it. We don't want you to be here at all then. And so they got offended, right? And, uh, and the Bible says in verse uh, 54, um, it said, when the disciples James and John, now who are James and John? Well, they were called the, th the sons of thunder. That's, that was their nickname. And when you think of thunder, uh, it, it, it's, it's a loud noise resulting from a lightning bolt, lightning strike, right? So there's a lightning strike psh, like that, and then there's thunder, right? Well, that's exactly what they were, their personality. They were sons of thunder. They made a lot of loud noise after something had, had struck, like, you know, something had happened, right? Like a lightning bolt. And so here they are. They looked at Jesus and said, oh! I can't believe they got so offended at you. You're the son of God, and they're, they're all ticked off because you're going to Jerusalem and not going to them to see them necessarily. Hey, what do you think, Jesus? And he said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them even as Elias did? Well, Elias in the Old Testament um, was uh, um, uh, the, the, the second in command or the assistant to Elijah and, and, and Elisha. And uh, was the Old Testament spelling, but Eli Elias was the New Testament spelling. Well, um, they, uh, uh, <laughs> Elijah had been carried up into heaven and uh, left his mantle and his rod, and Elisha took it, and the power of God was on him, and he crossed over the river. And so these teenage uh, boys made fun of Elisha, said, Go up, thou bald head! Go up, thou bald head! They were, they were mocking him, Elias. And, um, and then he, uh, he, he, he uh, well, wait a second. I, I think I got the wrong story. He commanded fire to come down from him and consume them. Well, that was the wrong one. That, the she bears came and got them. All right, so anyway, this is another story. But anyway, uh, but there were some that, uh, that Elias, Elias uh, commanded fire to come down from heaven. That was the prophets of Baal, and that was Elijah. There we go. Now I got my head screwed on straight. Brother Zach, can you delete this out of the, out of the uh, uh, video? And, uh, but anyway, that was Elijah uh, calling down um, uh, fire from heaven uh, with the prophets of Baal and stuff like that. So anyway, uh, but the fact of the matter is, it says uh, Jesus in verse 55 turned and rebuked them. We're talking James and John. And uh, he said, ye know not what manner of spirit ye are of. For the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. All right, so here's what Jesus was telling James and John. He said, look, fellas, you got the wrong manner of spirit. He says, you don't even know what you're, what you're saying. You don't understand what's going on. Now, that's a lowercase s. And last week, we spent some time teaching you about the spirit of man. There are four spirits mentioned in the Bible. The spirit of man, the spirit of God, the spirit of the world, and the spirit of the devil. And the spirit of man is man's attitude, disposition, and outlook. And Jesus looked at James and John and said, Look, man, your, your attitude, your, your disposition is completely wrong. He says, you have no idea what manner of spirit you're of. I'm not going to do what you say. And then he said, the Son of Man has not come to destroy men's life, lives, but to save them. Now, write this down for a definition. The word manner means form, method, ways of performing, a kind, and a sort. So that's what the word manner means. Manner is in reference to a form, a method, a way of performing something. Um, it's a kind, not, not to be kind, but it's a type or a kind of spirit. And then it's also a sort, all right? So when Jesus looked at James and John, he says, you have no idea what manner of spirit you are. You have, you have no idea, and it's wrong, and, and he rebuked them. Now listen to this. Listen to the statement. We should always reflect the spirit of Jesus with our spirit. 
This is important. We should always reflect the spirit of Jesus with our spirit. Now, wait a second. We're not talking about unsaved people that got rebuked here. We're not talking about church members that got rebuked here. We are talking about the disciples. We are talking about two of the 12 that had dedicated their lives. They've forsaken all. They followed Jesus, and they were giving their whole lives for the Lord. When the Lord was going to uh, be crucified and then three days later rise from the dead, uh, they were going to go into the ministry. They're going to be preachers and missionaries and, and give their lives, and all of them were going to die martyrs' deaths or exiled for the cause of Christ. So Jesus was not looking at the Pharisees or, or Sadducees. He was not looking at the lawyers. He was not looking at those that were unbelievers and saying this. He was not saying this to church members. He was saying this to leaders in his movement. Two of the 12 disciples. And Jesus said something like this. Hey, boys, you don't know what manner of spirit you're of. You're wrong. And let me tell you what I think about it. And so, basically, um, Jesus rebuked them. Now, now, what was wrong about their spirit? There are five things that are possibly the answer. It could be one of these. It could be a, a few of these. It could be all five of these. But there are five ways that you can tell you are of the wrong spirit. And let me give them to you right now. Look at verse 56. In verse number 56, it says this, For the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. All right, what was the first problem with their manner of spirit? Number one, write this down. It was destructive. They wanted to destroy these men. What? You don't like Jesus or you're ticked off because he wasn't going to your city, he's going to Jerusalem? All the, man, we're going to rain fire down from heaven and wipe you all out. Okay, so Jesus looked at them and said, hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. Wait a second. What do you think is going on here? He said, you think I hate them because they didn't receive me into their village? You think I want them dead because they didn't receive me into their village? He says, you know not what manner of spirit you're of. I did not come to destroy men's lives. I came to save them. By the way, the reason Jesus came to earth should be the reason we live for him. The Bible says that Jesus came to save lost souls. That's the purpose of why he came. That should be our cause. We should try to fulfill the cause that Jesus came. So he came to see sinners saved. We should give our lives to see sinners saved. But he simply said this, hey, fellas, you're wanting to destroy them. I did not want, I did not come to destroy people. I came to save people. So here's the thing. You know, and I don't care what your justification is. I don't care what it is. If you want to destroy somebody, you are not of the right spirit. Jesus did not come here to destroy men's lives. So many times uh, people leave this church angry at me or, um, you know, get very critical of me, and then they try to hurt the ministry here. They try to take people out of the church. They try to go on social media and say bad things about me. This, this one person, I, 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 I was told about this. I've not necessarily seen it myself, but I wrote him an email. Uh, and this is about... Uh, 12 years ago, 14 years ago, something like that. And he didn't like my email. Now, I, I thought I was being kind. I thought I was trying to be expressive and, and letting him know my position. And, uh, but, but he did not like it at all. And so he, he kept it, and then he, like, framed it. And every person he, could, he talked to about me or the church, he, I've got this letter from Pastor Sulin. He's a bad pastor. And, and, and he was using it as ammunition against me. And, and I, I remember that when I first experienced this back in 1995, uh, 95, the end of 95, there was a man that had come to our church um, uh, about the time, uh, well, during the um, Lamaze class of, uh, of, of my wife and I with David. We went to Lamaze class, and we met him and his wife, and, and suddenly they came to our church for a while. But, but at any rate, they, he got mad at me, and he left. The, now, he's not, I don't know if he's mad at me now. I mean, this is back in 1995. It's water under a bridge. It's, it, it really is. But he went on to another church, and that pastor contacted me, and he said, boy, he goes, you know, I think he would love nothing more than to see your church close. He is so mad at you. And I was just like, wow, that was my first experience 
that I've ever had with someone that, that I knew about here at Hopewell that literally wanted this church destroyed. I mean, just, just, just unbelievable. And, and, and then, of course, most recently last year uh, on Facebook, um, a former member of our church started attacking me on Facebook. And I confronted him. I said, look, now, what in the world? I mean, what? so you disagree with me on something. What in the world are you doing? Trying to, you, you want to see our church, dis, you want me destroyed? You want our church to cease to exist because we disagree on a topic? And he goes, I don't care if you're a soul winner. You're sinning and you're wrong. And I'm going to point it out. I'm like, man, what in the world? I mean, you're, you're really trying to hurt me. And what you're doing is you're hurting the cause of Christ. I'm like, I said, I already know I'm a sinner. You're, you're a sinner too, man. And I said, but, but the fact is, is I'm a soul winner. I'm trying to get everybody saved that I can. If you disagree with me, leave me alone. Go to another church. Just stop. But you don't have to try to destroy me. And, uh, of course, it didn't get through to him, so I just blocked him, you know. And it's just whatever, man. I mean, trying to be destructive. And there's so many times that I've noticed in our movement, the Independent Baptist Movement, where a lot of preachers get to the point where they get destructive. Um, there's a lot of, lot of, lot of televangelists I don't agree with at all on a lot of things. Um, but, but, but my job here is not to stand up and, uh, and destroy those, those men's ministries. You know, if somebody in our church is watching, you know, TBN, I, I, I think it's dangerous to watch TBN. I really do. There's so much on it that's just not biblical, uh, uh, Trinity Broadcast Network. But nonetheless, if you're watching TBN, I'm not mad at you. Uh, I'm not going to try to, you know, destroy any preacher on TBN or all these Christian so-called radio stations, all these health, wealth, and prosperity preachers. This one preacher, I saw an interview with him on, on Facebook, and, uh, and uh, he, you know, he was trying to justify his, you know, $30 million jet airplane, and he had, you know, 10 luxury cars and a couple of mansions, and he was worth, you know, $10 million, you know, and, you know whatever, pr cash and stuff. And so this uh, reporter came up to him and tried to, you know, put him on the spot and, you know, and, and he was looking like a fool, you know, because Jesus is not about that kind of stuff, you know. I mean, he was like, I, you know, he was trying to justify it. Well, here's the thing. I looked at it and I just said, man, I, he's a fraud. He's a, he's a fake preacher because of that, you know, because I could tell, you know, the Bible says you'll know them by their fruits. But I have never one time even mentioned his name, not even one time in any sermon that I've ever preached here at Hopewell Baptist Church. I'm not, I'm not interested in destroying his ministry. I'm not interested in dragging him down. Um, I will preach to you about principles. I'll tell you about false doctrine. I'll tell you to be leery of people who preach false doctrine, but, but I'm, not, I'm not interested in trying to destroy men's lives. I remember when um, uh, Dr. Hiles passed away and the pastor that took over after him, a bunch of people didn't like him. So they started uh, <laughs> preaching about him and uh, wanting to destroy his ministry. And um, th there, was this, uh, there was this one newspaper that came out like less than like 12 months after he became the new pastor. And, uh, and, and, and it, he was just, the whole thing was about what's wrong with him and just ripping his face off, trying to destroy him. And then sent those newspapers out all over America to a bunch of preachers and churches. I'm like, dude. <laughs> what in the world, you know? And um, I remember when, Ma when uh, Pastor Mike Ray and I talked on the phone after Dr. Hiles passed away and after the next pastor was, I, I don't want to refer to his name because he's in jail right now, so he ended up not being um, all that he could have been and should have been. But, um, but the fact of the matter is, Pastor Ray called me on the phone one night and he goes, you know, we all, all of us ought to thank God for something. And I, and I said, what's that? He goes, that we're not the, the next pastor of First Baptist. Because <laughs> he said, uh, you know, he's going to be attacked. Oh, is he going to be attacked? And, of course, he was. And, um, but at any rate, um, the truth of the matter is, is I, I had no part in that. In fact, I got very, very angry at preachers that they seemed bent on destroying him. Now, God bless you. The, the truth of the matter is, it's not our job to destroy people. If you have a destructive spirit, you don't have the spirit of Christ. It is not your job to destroy men's lives. It's your job to save them. Amen. There's, um, there's a preacher friend of mine named Chuck Harding. We're gonna, I'm going to recommend in, um, in um, our missions conference in September that we take him on for support. He's, he's, um, he's a good man. He's, he's a missionary to the politicians in Washington, D.C. 
And so he just spends his life trying to reach politicians. And uh, he, he founded a, 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 a something called Capital Connection um, and uh, Awake America. He founded all that stuff. Well, he had done something wrong 33 years ago. 33 years ago, he had done something wrong. It was not, it was not adultery. It was not. He did something inappropriate. But it, it was not adultery. He did not disqualify himself from being in the ministry at all. And, and if he committed adultery, he, he, it doesn't matter. Here, here we go. He did not do that. He went to his pastor. He was on staff. His pastor let him go. And spent, I think, about a year or so restoring him, getting him right with God, getting him to overcome what his inappropriateness was. And then he got rehired on, on staff at the same church. So his pastor successfully restored him, which is what um, Galatians chapter 5 is all about. Well, years, 30 years in the future now, back to our current time, he had gone from ministry to ministry, serving God, and was successfully serving God. And some uh, newspaper reporter down in uh, Fort Worth, Texas, was trying to write articles to destroy the Independent Baptist Church movement in America and trying to pull up a bunch of skeletons about preachers who had been either immoral or inappropriate um, in their ministry. And so they had heard about him. She had. And she was, okay, I'm going to zero in on Chuck Harding. Well, the brethren came to Chuck Harding and said, you need to resign or offer a resignation. That way, you know, um, <laughs> you're trying to take the high road. So he said, all right. So he offered his resignation. They took it. He was like, what? <laughs> I thought, I thought I was just supposed to, you know, do this like I'm willing to resign, but I thought you said you weren't going to ask me to. No, no, we want you to. And now there's a bunch of preachers across America that are bent on destroying it uh, for something he did 33 years ago that he was biblically restored over. And the, the sin, the inappropriateness he committed was not a disqualifier. And besides, he's not a pastor. I mean, he's not a pastor. He, he's just a missionary. He's a, he's, he preaches in churches, but he's not a pastor. And so, anyway, it's just nonsense. But these guys, they call themselves spiritual, but they are bent on destroying him. And he has done so much good, so much good for the cause of Christ. So he just said he changed churches. He started a brand new ministry, and he's going on for the Lord. And so he's got this uh, um, uh, Mission America, I think is the name of his ministry now, Mission America. And he's trying to encourage people to, all over America to, to, to win their politicians in their states and cities to Christ and pray for them and, and, um, and Mission America. And so I'm going to recommend that we take him on because he's a good man. But it's so sad that you know a lot of times preachers, a lot of times people in our movement, we are so right all the time with doctrine that we carry it too far and feel we need to destroy people. That's not the spirit of Christ. We're supposed to save people. If somebody in this church falls, there should not be one person in this church that wants to see them destroyed. We ought to want to restore them in the spirit of me. That's what it says in Galatians 5. We ought, ye who are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness. That's what the Bible says. So when someone messes up in this church or has a problem in this church, don't write them off. Don't say, you're never coming back here. Don't say, we don't ever want to see you again. Uh, we want we to be there to help them get restored. That's, that's the whole idea. God is not interested in destroying men's lives. He is interested in saving them. All right, number two. Look at 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. First Peter chapter 3. <clears throat> By the way, I was not referring to John Wilkerson in case anybody was thinking, oh, we just met him. What happened? You know, I'm talking about the pastor before him uh, when I gave that illustration. John Wilkerson is still the pastor of First Baptist. He's a great man, great man. All right, First Peter chapter 3. I just want to make sure nobody was thinking the wrong thoughts there. <laughs> First Peter chapter 3, and look down at verse number 8. It says this, Finally, be ye all of one mind, Having compassion one of another, love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous. Now the word, the word pitiful in the Bible is not like our word pitiful now. When we say, oh, you're pitiful, 
usually we're referring to a youth pastor. Uh, but no, uh, <laughs> we, <laughs> we, just making sure you're awake, brothers. That, but uh, would, would we would we use the term pitiful? We use it as a disdain, like oh. You're pitiful, right? Well, the Bible does not use that word pitiful in that in that way. Don't worry, Miss Marissa, I was just joking. But anyway, uh, the word the word pitiful here means to be of genuine concern, great compassion. You know, being very thoughtful of somebody. To pity them in the Bible literally means to have great care over them. All right, so it says be pitiful, be courteous. Look what it says in verse 9. Not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrarize, blessing, knowing that ye are thereunto called, that ye should inherit a blessing. For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. Let them eschew evil and do good. Let them seek peace and ensue it for the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. Number two, write this down. Hurtful. Hurtful. Um, why was it that Jesus said to the disciples, James and John, you know not what spirit, manner of spirit you're of. You're wrong. And he rebuked them. Why? Because they had a hurtful spirit. They wanted to hurt those guys. Wanted to hurt them. If there is ever any ounce of, of strength or possession inside your bones and your body that wants to hurt people you're not of the right spirit they hurt me i don't care I don't care who hurts you don't try to hurt anybody don't lift up a finger to hurt anybody don't you try to say hurtful words again i've said this many times over the years the, the saying sticks and stones may break my bones but words will never hurt me whoever came, came up with that's just a just a liar that words hurt and you don't want to be hurtful with your words you don't want to be hurtful with your actions. You in your spirit should never want to be hurtful to anybody. That's why when the Bible says, when your enemy stumbles, don't rejoice because it's going to displease God and, and he may withhold his punishment on him. All right? So God is saying, don't, don't ever enjoy someone who stumbles. Don't, don't want someone to be hurt. Don't have a hurtful spirit towards others he says there in uh first peter chapter three it says uh render uh not rendering evil for evil railing for railing he said but contrarize he said and the other said uh blessings he says this is what you're called to do bless those that hurt you pray for those who despitefully use you bless those who curse you uh god says to be a blessing to be a help not a hurt so god doesn't want you to hurt people that's the wrong kind of spirit the spirit of being hurtful is bad, all right? So what was wrong with James and John's spirit? They were hurtful. And so number two, hurtful. The first thing that we've learned, which is what's wrong with James and John, is that they were destructive. They wanted to destroy those people's lives. Number two, they wanted to hurt them. Number three, look at Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. Now, again, we're talking, about, if you would embrace this on a practical sense, God's going to bless you, and your Christian life is going to be so much better. So let's learn from these disciples. Again, not unsaved people, not church members, dedicated followers of Christ, two of the 12 disciples. And, um, and Jesus says, you know not what manner of spirit you're of. He was saying, you've got the wrong spirit. And, um, and then he was, again, explaining why. But this is a, a third possible reason for why their spirit was wrong. Romans 12, verse 17. It says this, recompense to no man evil for evil, provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in doing so, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. What was the second, third uh, reason why their spirit, they were the wrong manner of spirit? Write this down. Number three, vengeful. Vengeful. If you ever have the spirit of vengeance, that's not of Christ. 
You hurt me, I am hurting you back. You did this to me, I'm doing this to you. That's vengeance. I hope you get what's coming to you. Jesus says that's the wrong spirit. Don't be a vengeful uh, Christian. Don't be a vengeful person. Don't you dare. That, that's not, vengeance belongs to God. And by the way, God said, I will repay. That means this. If you think you can do a better job of, 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 of what God does, then that's a serious, serious problem in your Christian life. You do not need to execute vengeance. If someone has done you wrong, let God take care of it. It says in verse 19, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. The right spirit says, okay, God, they did wrong to me. You take care of it. You take care of it. That's the right spirit. And God says he will. But he says right here, if it be possible, if it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Now, obviously, sometimes it's not possible to be at peace with certain people. Um, if someone comes and, you know, um, tries to blow up America, then we need to defend America. We, we don't need to just let the uh, Islamic terrorists come in here and try to kill us and wipe us out. Uh, that's not possible to live at peace with those people. Sometimes when people are relentless to attack and to attack and to attack and they just keep on attacking, um, then it's, it's just, especially when it comes to physical, especially when it comes to um, killing and things like that, uh, then it, it, sometimes it's, it's just not possible and, and you have to fight, you have to defend. But that's, that's, that's rare. That's not like every day. You know, if someone just, you know, takes your parking spot, don't, don't slit their tires. You know what I'm saying? You don't, you don't do that. That's, that's ridiculous. And so, um, but the fact of the matter is, God says, if it be possible, live peaceably with all men. And he says, don't have a vengeful spirit. He says, dearly beloved, avenge not yourself. Now, now by the way, this avenge not yourselves is not saying if it be possible, avenge not yourselves. That's not what he's saying. He says if it be possible, live peaceably. But he says if you can't live peaceably with somebody, don't avenge yourself. He says I will. I will have vengeance. That's my job. I'm God. And so these um, James and John, it's quite possible they had a vengeful spirit. They probably said, hey, we wanted to stay here, and you're, not only are you not letting Jesus stay here, we can't stay here either because we're with Jesus. Man, let's call fire down from heaven and destroy these miserable people. Uh, it might have been a sense of a vengeful spirit, and we're never supposed to have that. Number four, look at Romans 14. Uh, look at Romans 14. You should have been in Romans 12, so just one page over. All right, Romans 14. Look at verse 1. It says, him that is weak in the faith receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. For one believeth that he may eat all things, another who is weak eateth herbs. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not. And let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth, for God hath received him. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. One man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. He that regardeth the day regardeth it unto the Lord, and he that regardeth not the day to the Lord he doth not regard it. He that eateth eateth to the Lord, for he giveth Giveth God thanks, and he that eateth not to the Lord, he eateth not, and giveth God thanks. For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord, and whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ both died and rose, received, or revived, that he might be the Lord both of the dead and the living and living. But why do, dost thou judge thy brother? For why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Let us not, therefore, judge one another any more, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. All right. The, the fourth thing about their spirit was it was judgmental. They were judging them. Look at you. You're not right with God. You didn't receive Jesus and us into your village. Obviously, you don't love the Lord. Obviously, you're not right with God. And that judgmental spirit. God tells us right here very plainly in Romans 14. 
He says, everybody serves God, and we all have to answer to him. Don't you judge another man's servant. So, <clears throat> it's easy for preachers to say this is how God wants us to do things here at Hopewell. And if someone in a different church does things differently, it's easy to judge them. It's easy to condemn them. That's, that's the sinful nature, the sinful spirit. But God says, don't be judgmental. Hey, if someone does something different than you, if someone eats herbs and you eat meat, or someone eats meat and you eat herbs, if someone looks at one day and says, this is the most important day of the week, and another person says, every day is important, not, not just one, every day is important. God says, look, don't judge anybody that believes differently than you. They have one person that they answer to, and that's God. And he says, every one of us will stand before the, before the Lord one day and will be judged by him at the judgment seat of Christ. So then it just simply says, you know, just to wrap up the whole thought in uh, verse number 13, it says, let us not therefore judge one another anymore. Don't be judging people. Don't say you do it differently than I do, so you must not be right with God, and I am. <laughs> Jesus was saying here, uh, Paul was saying through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Romans 14, that it's quite possible that both people are right with God. Just doing things differently. Um, we have church on Saturday night, obviously, in case you didn't know. <laughs> we're here. But there's some preachers across America that pff, they would never have church on Saturday night. That's compromising. Woo! It's compromised to have church on Saturday night. Well, that's simply not true. Um, they're not compromising. I, I don't think we're compromising. But some people don't want to have church on Saturday night. That's fine. They have to answer to God for themselves and their own schedule and their own church. I'm not judging anybody that doesn't have church on Saturday night. Are you listening? But people shouldn't judge me and our church in a negative way because we have church on Saturday night. One of the biggest reasons why people judge churches that have church on Saturday night is because the, contem the contemporary Christian movement... <sighs> Has a lot of like a lot of times they have contemporary services on Saturday night that's worldly, and then Sunday morning they have the traditional services for the old fo old fogies, you know, people that like the hymns. And they rock for Jesus on Saturday night, and they sing the old traditional hymns on Sunday morning. Well, obviously that that's wrong, but but to have church on Saturday night, we can still have traditional services. We don't have to be contemporary and worldly and having a rock concert. You know, and so uh, the truth of the matter is, though, every one of us uh, judge. Okay, so I go soul winning every single day, every day of my life. I go soul winning. Today I went soul winning, got to lead a six-year-old girl to the Lord. I'd led her grandmother to the Lord two years ago, and uh, she's visiting from Texas. I may never see her again. You know, she's just here visiting. And But Grandma let me lead her to Christ, and she got saved. I go soul winning every single day. But if you don't go soul winning every single day, it doesn't mean you're not right with God. doesn't mean that at all. So I can't look at you and judge you, and you shouldn't look at me and judge me by saying, oh, you're going to lose your family because you're a daily soul winner. You know, I've had people criticize me for that. You know, because all my boys haven't all turned out like I am and like I want them to turn out. So then they try to judge me. Oh, I know why. I know why you have problems. You go soul winning too much. You have forsaken your family to go soul winning. All that garbage, all that judging. So the fact of the matter is, if there's a preacher friend of mine who doesn't go soul winning every day, but he is a soul winner, I don't look at him and say, when are you going to get right with God and start going soul winning every day? I don't do that because he has to answer to God for his schedule. I answer to God for my schedule. There's not a command in the Bible that says go soul winning every day, but there are implications in the Bible that people did go soul winning every day. So it's a, it's a worthy thing to ascribe to. It's a good thing to ascribe to. Obviously, in the Bible, God tells you to go to church every week or at least go to church, you know, don't forsake church, but it doesn't necessarily say how many times you go. But the more you go, I really think the better off it, your Christian life is. All these people, I don't have to go to church Sunday school, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Well, goody, goody, goody for you. You live your life always saying, I don't have to do this. Sound like a teenager to me. A rebellious teenager is what that spirit is. Don't say I don't have to. Say, man, if I can, I will. And, and, and I'm not talking about, you know, a lot of times people say, oh, I couldn't go to church because of this, that, and the other. Uh, there's all kinds of things that we say we can't go to church over, which is just simply ridiculous. They're just excuses. They're just cop-outs. Now, if you're homesick, you don't want to spread any kind of sickness to anybody else, that's, that's a good reason not to come to church. It, re it really is. But just to say, I just want to hang out with my family. Well, hang out with your family on, on Thursday night. Tuesday night, Monday night, Sunday afternoon. What? 
you have to hang out with your family during a church service? Ah, that's just garbage. That's just excuses. That's just ridiculousness. Of course there are times when we can do things for God and we come up with any excuse that we want to. And that's just, that's just you want to live that way? Go for it. I'm not living that way. I'm not living my life with excuses. I'm going to live my life saying, how much can I do for God? Not what can I get, a, get away with? You know, I don't have to give to missions. There's no command in the Bible that says I have to give to missions. All right, ask yourself this question. Do you think God would be pleased if you gave to missions? Do you think if financing the gospel all around the world is really the intent of the Great Commission to get the gospel around the world? Okay, then, then okay, do it. Now, I support, you know, uh, my wife and I support uh, 14 missionaries on average a month. We give $700 a month to missions, but I don't look at any of you and judge you and say, if you don't give $700 a month to missions, you're not as spiritual as I am. I don't ever say that. I, I think it's good to give to missions, but it's between you and God. How much? If you give five bucks a month, 10 bucks a month. See, some of us, we do support missions. It's called Starbucks. You support the coffee bean in this mission, getting coffee around the world. Now, I don't mind going to Starbucks or going to get fancy coffee. What I do mind is getting fancy coffee and not support missions. All right, number six, uh, five and last. Last, last point. The, the first four things that we dis discussed tonight, why was Jesus saying to James and John, you know not what manner of spirit you're of? It's because they probably had a destructive spirit. In fact, he specifically said, I didn't come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. Number two, they were hurtful with their spirit. Number three, they were vengeful with their spirit. Number four, they were judgmental with their spirit. And number five, look at Proverbs 14. Now, we're going to look at six places in the Scripture quickly. We're just going to go right through them just quickly. Uh, Proverbs 14, verse 17. Proverbs 14 in verse 17. Look what it says now. Proverbs 14 in verse 17, it says, He that is soon angry dealeth foolishly, and a man of wicked devices is hated. Next, number five, write this down, angry. An angry spirit. Now watch this carefully now. God says right here, he that is soon angry. Now listen carefully. All anger is not sin. But you, you shouldn't be a type of person that it doesn't take much for you to get angry. And you shouldn't be the type of person that, get, that your anger's out of control. That you, you, you blow your stack. You got steam coming out of your ears. Uh, you can be angry and keep it under control. You really can. But God says here clearly, he that is soon angry, Dealeth foolishly. Next, look at, look at Proverbs 21, verse 19. Proverbs 21. I don't want to have an angry spirit. I don't want that. I, I want to live my life with a smile on my face. I don't want to be angry at, at, at people and angry at things and angry at the liberals in America destroying our country and just be angry all the time, angry at what happened this past uh, 2019 session with the liberal control of Colorado and all the bills they passed. I don't want to just be angry all the time. I don't. I want to be angry at, at, at the women's soccer team. I am an American, and I love to root for America to win. But I could have cared less if the women's soccer team won last week. Bunch of stinking, ungrateful, disrespectful, so-called Americans. Go play for some country that you don't have to tr tread over the flag and step on it and say a curse word about our president. Go to some other country then and play soccer. Stinking good for nothing. Oh man, so if I start thinking about it, I start, Ugh. but I don't wanna just live that way. I don't wanna just live that way. They had their little parade in New York City and that soccer star couldn't help herself. She said the F word again, real loud, while she was giving her speech. Well. What in the world is wrong with our society? We look at someone using the F word and cuss words publicly like that, and we ah, applaud them. Just applaud them. It's just insane. It's absolutely rotten to the core, disgusting and insane. But I'm not going to live my whole life angry about it. I'm not going to be angry. I'm not just going to be mad at the world and 
just constantly being angry. Man, I got things to live for. I got, I got a life to live. Yes, I'm upset with it, but my anger is under control. It's not, it's not making me lose my brain. I'm not, I'm not going out, out of my mind because I'm upset with what people are doing and their, their silliness. Um, look, look at Proverbs 21, 19. Are you, have I read that yet? All right, 21, 19. It is better to dwell in the wilderness than with a contentious and an angry woman. You know what God says? He says, men, don't ever get married. <laughs> if you get married to an angry woman. He said, look, go, listen to me now. Y'all, y'all didn't let me finish my sentence. Y'all, y'all got too, too, too carried away there. Don't ever get married if you marry an angry woman. So here's what he said. Go live in the wilderness instead of living with a contentious and angry woman. That's what he said right there. It's, it's Bible. It's got to be there for a reason. Don't be a contentious and angry-spirited person. Just angry all the time, all the time, all the time. God says, go, go move out in the wilderness. Go live under the stars. Live, live with, the, with the trees and the animals as opposed to living with a contentious and angry woman. All right, let's continue. Proverbs 22, verse 24. Proverbs 22, verse 24. Now look at this now. Make no friendship with an angry man, and with a furious man thou shalt not go. So here's what God says. You, 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 know, you know people that are angry all the time? God says, don't be their friend. Wow. That's what it says. Make no friendship with an angry man. Don't be their friend. That's what it says. Don't say, hey, you're an angry person. Let's be friends. God says, no. And it says, with a furious man thou shalt not go. That means this. Don't get in a car with someone furious don't go out to eat with someone who's furious don't go on vacation with someone who's furious god says right there stay away from these people that's exactly what god's saying why because an angry spirit is bad don't be angry all the time don't be furious all the time you know not what manner spirit you're of look at 29 verse 22 proverbs 29 we're almost done I thought this was going to be a short sermon. <laughs> Proverbs 29, 22. Look what it says now. Proverbs 29, 22. It says, an angry man stirreth up strife, and a furious man aboundeth in transgression. So someone who has an angry spirit, they stir up problems. They stir up fights. Ah, I got to find someone to fight. And then it says, a furious man aboundeth in transgression. That means a person who's furious is constantly sinning because his anger is out of control. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter 7. Just two more verses and we're done. Ecclesiastes is just the next book over from Proverbs. Ecclesiastes chapter 7. Look at verse 9. Ecclesiastes, it's just five or six pages over to the right. Ecclesiastes chapter 7, look at verse 9. Be not hasty in thy spirit to be angry. Look what it says now. For anger resteth in the bosom of fools. You know what God says? If you're quick to get angry, you're just like, wow, it just doesn't take much to set you off. God says you're a fool. It says, anger resteth in the bosom of of fools. Listen, it ought to take a lot for you to get angry. Not a little, a lot. And it ought to be still under control. It ought to be controlled anger. One last verse, and we're all done. Titus chapter 1, verse 7, New Testament. Titus is just two books before Hebrews. Titus, Philemon, and then Hebrews. So Titus chapter (sighs) 1. And look down at verse number seven. Last verse, last thought. We'll summarize the, the sermon and then we'll, we'll go home. Brother Zach's buying all the food. He got so much money for food, he does more than enough to spend, so he thought, I'll treat everybody who comes to church on Saturday night. He's taking us out to eat. Titus chapter one. We sold those last 30 candy bars. Woo! 
We got food money. All right. <laughs> Titus chapter 1. Look at verse number, number 7. God's giving us the qualification of a pastor here, a bishop. It says, for a bishop, that's a pastor, must be blameless as the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre. God says the bishop, the pastor of the church, those who ascribe to be in pastoral position, you should never be a person that's soon angry. Never. Never be a striker. You know what a striker is? Someone who throws the first punch. That's a striker. It doesn't mean you can't defend yourself. It just means don't ever throw the first punch. So God says... The qualifica- one of the qualifications of a bishop is not to be soon angry. Now you say, preacher, have you ever failed at this? Of course I have. I'm not telling you at all that I have never been destructive in my spirit or hurtful or vengeful or judgmental or angry. Of course I've committed these sins. Of course I, like James and John, I have no right to look down upon James and John, sons of thunder, say, ha, ah, look at you, Ed, Jesus rebuked you. Uh, he's rebuked me many times, Jesus has, over the years. I think after 25 years of pastoring, my spirit has grown when it comes to how I respond to people. I used to have, yes, more often than I wish I had, a destructive, hurtful, vengeful, judgmental, angry spirit. Yes, I have. I've, of course I have. But I think as time has gone by, I hope and I believe it to be true that now at the age of 50, 25 years in the ministry, I am less destructive and hurtful and vengeful and judgmental and angry than I used to be. That's the whole idea. If God has spoken to your heart in any of these five things tonight, your job is is to respond with humility. Ask God for his mercy and work on your spirit to becoming more Christ-like. Instead of allowing destructive, hurtful, vengeful, judgmental, angry spirits just reside in your bosom. This is who I am. No. Become like Christ. James and John, you blew it. But guess what? Your life's not over. Jesus didn't throw them away. He rebuked them, but he didn't throw them away. And if you've been rebuked tonight by the preaching of the Word of God, it's okay. You don't have to feel like you're thrown away. Just work on what God spoke to you about. Make tomorrow a better day. Next week a better week. Next month a better month. Next year a better year. And let's go forward. Father, thank you.